Good morning. morning. If you're able, please stand for the reading of God's word as we read from Psalm 110, verses 1 and 2, and from Romans chapter 1, verses 1 through 7. Hear the word of the Lord. The Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. The Lord will extend your mighty scepter from Zion. You will rule in the midst of your enemies. Paul writing to the believers in Rome. Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle and set apart for the gospel of God, the gospel he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures regarding his son, who as to his human nature was a descendant of David and who through the spirit of holiness was declared with power to be the son of God by his resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Through him and for his name's sake, we received grace and apostleship to call people from among all the Gentiles to the obedience that comes from faith. And you also are among those who are called to belong to Jesus Christ to all in Rome who are loved by God and called to be saints, grace and peace to you from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Yes, thanks be to God. You may be seated. Now, I don't know how many of you keep up with the Avenger movies, (laughs) but they are very popular. And the latest in the series comes out Friday, and it's called The End Game. And some of you are probably hoping that that's the end of these movies. But now these movies, they've brought back into our culture mythology and and legend and, and enchantment. And it's brought it back to the forefront of the culture's thinking. Because they capture the imagination with human potentiality the drama of of world-ending threats, of being taken over by another empire or, or ruler. And whatever the outcome, we, with our technology and a little bit of mysticism, are able to save ourselves. And you might think that that's a comic book. Well, yeah, and that, that's true. It is. And you might think it's too far-fetched. But It's not that far-fetched because we have, for years, blended bodies, humans, and machines. We've we've bonded humanity and and technology, and we use it to help keep us alive, don't we? I mean, we have chips installed in our pets so we know where they are. We have computer-aided pacemakers. Patches that can help diabetics keep track of their blood sugar level. Robotics, prostheses. And so some have faith in in blending human, humanity, and and technology, humans and machines. So so these comic books, you know, they, they present, so the movies are based on comic books. But they present some, some very attractive motifs. And these movies, like other pieces of literature and art, they express a deep human longing. And that's to be unified and to grow continually. So we want humanity to continue and at the same time have something that's bigger than us that brings us all together. But where does this longing come from and and how is it filled? Well, the longing is God-given, and Jesus, his resurrection from the dead, fulfills this longing. And for this reason, everyone ought to believe in the resurrected Christ. He is risen. All right, some of you sound like you believe that. Now, normally we think of of the resurrection as, as a useful fact of faith when we're confronted with death. And don't get me wrong, that aspect of this truth 
is a great source of comfort. It is a great source of comfort to me personally, and I know it is a great source of comfort to many of you personally as well. But the Bible presents Christ's resurrection as the key to everything. The centerpiece of the gospel, the thing that makes the gospel the good news is that Jesus Christ died and was raised to life. But why? Is Jesus raised from the dead? Why is it good news for all people? Why is his rising from the dead the key to everything? See, in the Bible, you read that there, there are others who were raised from the dead. Elijah raised people from the dead. He raised, he raised the widow's son from the dead. Jesus raised you know, one person's daughter from the dead. You know, he raised Lazarus from the dead. Why isn't their coming back to life considered good news? What makes Jesus' resurrection different? Well, here in Romans 1, in these seven verses, it answers these questions by telling us that Jesus' resurrection is different because of who he is. It shapes identity while giving ground for you, our unity since he is resurrected to reign. See, his resurrection is different because of who he is. Here in verses 1 through 4, we get insight into Jesus and his resurrection. For Paul writes, he says, a Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle and set apart for the gospel of God. The gospel he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures regarding his son, who as to his human nature was a descendant of David, and who through the spirit of holiness was declared with power to be the son of God by his resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord. So who is Jesus? So he is the fulfillment of God's gospel promise. So from Genesis to Malachi, God was revealing his plan through his prophets. And here in Romans, we learned that the, the gospel wasn't just something that came about when Jesus showed up. But it was always God's plan, and Jesus alone fulfills God's gospel promise. In Galatians 3, 8 and 9, he tells us that God's gospel promise was preached in advance, the scripture foresaw that God would justify the Gentiles by faith and announce the gospel in advance to Abraham. All nations will be blessed through you. So those who have faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. You see, God's promise to Abraham was that he would have a descendant who would be the blessing to all nations. And Galatians 3.16 says that Christ is that promised descendant of Abraham. The promises were spoken to Abraham and to his seed. The scripture does not say, and to seeds, meaning many people, but and to your seed, meaning one person, who is Christ. So Jesus is God's gospel promise fulfilled. But he's also, the text tells us, he's David's royal son. Verse 3, regarding his son, who as to his human nature was a descendant of David, David is Israel's greatest king, a royal. He was promised a royal son whose rule would be worldwide. And that was our Old Testament reading in Psalm 110, where the Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. The Lord will extend your mighty scepter from Zion. You will rule in the midst of your enemies. See, this refers to Jesus. And Peter declares this on the day of Pentecost when he quotes this same psalm to prove that Jesus is David's promised royal descendant. He says in verse 33 of Acts 2, exalted to the right hand of God, he has received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit and has poured out what you now see and hear. For David did not ascend to heaven, and yet he said, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. You see, Jesus is David's royal son, but he's also, the, the, the passage tells us, the son of God. Verse 3 and 4 of Romans 1, regarding his son, who as to his human nature was a descendant of David, and who through the spirit of holiness was declared with power to be the son of God. By his resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ, our Lord. 
You see, Jesus' resurrection is different because of who he is. He is the fulfillment of God's gospel promise, the royal son of David and the divine son of God. He is, did you, see the, did you hear the text? The text, the gospel, Jesus is the gospel. The significance of his identity and how it distinguishes his resurrection from others means that his resurrection has the power now to shape identities. This is point number two. That his resurrection shapes identity. Identity, it's a big deal these days, isn't it? Uh, you know, you can't, you can't hardly listen to anything or see a commercial on, on television where, where somehow it's not suggesting to you an identity or telling you how your identity is formed. So it's a, it's a big deal these days. And, and identity, is, it's formed through family experiences, through culture and, and values, our work, our decisions and, and habits. All of these help us, help make us who we are. Identity is both personal and it's collective as we live in a, a community. So we can't know who we are outside of seeing ourselves through the eyes of other people. That's why it's not good to be alone. We love, we want to be loved. We want to belong, we want, to, we want meaning. And you can only find that in community. So, I, so identity is complex. But I left out one thing, change. See, change also shapes our identity. And so when you think about that, collectively, as a community, Jesus Christ, his resurrection, entering the community of, of humanity, he changed things, didn't he? You might ask how. Well, Paul says it here in, verse one, in, in chapter 1, verse 5 and 7. Through him and for his name's sake, we receive grace and apostleship to call people from among all the Gentiles to the obedience that comes from faith. And you also are among those who are called to belong to Jesus Christ, to all in Rome who are loved by God and called to be saints. See, Paul says, through him and for his name's sake, the believers in Rome were finding a new identity through Jesus and for Jesus. See, they were given grace, they were given apostleship. That's to say that they were given favor and purpose. They were also given love and belonging. These are powerful things. These are powerful things that, that every person, male or female, young, old, rich, poor, need in order for their identity to, to, to be formed and be healthy. So whenever... This is interesting. Whenever someone commits a, a crime or, or a suicide, one of the first things that, that investigators will check is what is it that they've been thinking about? What were they reading? What were they searching the internet for? Why, they, why do they do that? So they want to know what this, this person has been identifying with. You know, earlier this week, there was an 18-year-old girl, Saul Pace, who was said to be infatuated with the Columbine massacres. And the 20 year anniversary was approaching. Her parents reported her missing on, on Monday. He, she had flown to Denver and purchased a shotgun and ammunition and it was believed that her intentions were to carry out a Columbine-like attack on a school. Well, as you've heard the story, Pace, she ended up committing suicide. But what is believed to have happened with her is that she formed an identity around the Columbine killers. Like the shooters at, at Sandy Hook and Virginia Tech, she found the Columbine shooters inspirational. She had a website where she placed scanned pages from her journal, and the homepage was under the name Dissolved Girl. And page after page described a lot of self-loathing and, and hatred of humanity. She said, I feel like a pot of scalding water on the verge of boiling over, so dangerously close to spilling over, and what that may cause is yet to be seen and most likely a hazard to myself and others. See, Saul Pace was building her identity. She was building her identity on, on some darkness. And that darkness was, had diminished her, and, and she, she described herself as dissolving. You know, see, that, this is the result. The result was a narrowing of her identity. 
You see, there's no, there's, no, there's no growth, there's no expansion in the narrow confines of hatred and anger. But Christ's resurrection leads to gifts of favor and purpose, love and belonging. You know, we're being told these days that, that if other people have a problem with who you are, they should take it up with your creator. Have you heard that? But they don't tell you who their creator is. See, if you're your own creator, or you allow your culture or, or some other group you're infatuated with to shape and create your identity, you're, you would be like Miss Pace. Your identity will dissolve. But if your creator is Christ, then he infuses your identity in, with growing, meaningful, grace-filled, loving ways. Because Jesus produces his likeness, his image in us by the power of his spirit. His resurrection is a promise that there are more like him to come. Listen to Colossians 1.18. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn, or prototype, from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. So personally and collectively, his resurrection forms and shapes identity. It's Christ's resurrection yeah, it not only shapes identity, and, and in so doing, it, it gives foundation for unity that, that is built on a shared grace, a shared purpose and love that are all given by a shared risen Christ. See, his resurrection is the ground for unity. You see, Paul, he's a Jew, he's writing, he's writing to these Gentiles, and the word there for Gentiles is ethnos. It's a word that means, and it, it's a word that's sometimes translated nation, but, but it, it, it means race. So, so and, it's, and it's the word from which we get our word ethnicity. So the work and the purpose of, of those whose identity is shaped by Jesus is to call the human family to the obedience that comes from faith. You say, Pastor, what does that mean? Well, it's a faith that is fueled by believing the gospel. It's believing that this favor God has given you, that you are loved, you belong to God and Christ. And it's proven in your living it out, in, the, in your obedience. So, you know, Rome was made up of a variety of, of conquered nations. And so... So all these different ethnicities, you know, hearing the news of Christ, hearing, hearing the gospel, it gave them a sense of belonging that, 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 that gave to these groups a certain security. You know, one of the things that distinguished Christianity from the religion of Rome and, and the Greeks was, the sense, was this sense of belonging that came from being in Christ. Rodney Stark in his book, The Triumph of Christianity, How the Jesus Movement Became the World's Largest Religion, don't you love that title? He talks about how Rome didn't allow congregations. Temple goers didn't belong to the temple. Stark says that people patronized several temples and, and various gods depending on their tastes and needs, but there was no congregational life. Does that sound familiar? Because there was, there was no congregation in the sense of regular gatherings of groups and have, or having a, a common religious focus and a sense of belonging. But by the year 200, Christians were not without significance in Rome and, and many other cities as well. Stark writes, unlike pagans, Rome's 19,000 Christians were well organized. They belonged to relatively small, intense congregations and they may have even had their own neighborhoods. Christians could easily be mobilized vis-a-vis -vis local affairs, which greatly amplified their numbers. Thus, the size and effectiveness of the Christian communities may well have been a factor in the persecution that fell upon them in 250 and again a half a century later. Yeah, so this sense of belonging gave these ethnic groups purpose as they met together across these lines, the lines of, of ethnicity. And it, and it fueled their unity and it created these congregations which were illegal in the Roman Empire. So you see what they did with their unity? They defied the Roman Empire. But it wasn't because they were antagonistic 
against the empire. They weren't, they weren't antagonistic against Rome. It was because they proclaimed Jesus. And their proclamation was upsetting to the religions of the empire. It was upsetting to the economics of the empire. You remember the story in, in Acts when, at Ephesus? You know, the clerk comes out and says, well, you know, we, yeah, people are no longer buying our gods. They're not buying the idols. Uh, their, their, their economy was affected. No. And so eventually it became a threat to the empire itself. But what did they proclaim about Jesus? They proclaimed that Jesus was resurrected to reign. This means, yeah, this means you know, that their allegiance belonged to Christ. And when they, as they preached and, and proclaimed Christ, they were calling people to switch their allegiance. Because he is resurrected to reign. You see, the reason Jesus' resurrection is different, the reason it shapes identity, the reason his resurrection gives the grounds for unity is because Jesus was resurrected to reign. Verses 3 and 4 says this, regarding his son, who as to his human nature was a descendant of David and who through the spirit of holiness was declared with power to be the son of God by his resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord. See, he's David's royal son. He's the son of God. Jesus is both the king of heaven and earth. Amen. Amen. Yes. It was preached that Jesus was dead, but, and now he is alive, and he is Lord and king. So that right now, in that moment, and even today, Jesus Christ is Lord and king. And the beauty of it is, as such, he forgives sins. Acts 5, 30 and 31 says this, The God of our fathers raised Jesus from the dead, whom you had killed by hanging him on a tree. God exalted him to his right hand as prince and savior, that he might give repentance and forgiveness of sins to Israel. So Jesus, as king, he forgives your sins. He forgives our sins. In Romans 14, it says, as, as king, he is Lord over the living and the dead. Romans 14, 7 and 9. For none of us lives to himself alone, and none of us dies to himself alone. If we live, we live to the Lord, and if we die, we die to the Lord. So whether we live or die, we belong to the Lord. For this very reason, Christ died and returned to life, so that he might be the Lord of both the living and the dead. You see, being resurrected, Jesus being resurrected, he's Lord of the living and the dead, but also being resurrected to reign means that he is the ruler of the kings of the earth. Listen to Revelation 1, 4, and 5. Grace and peace to you from him who is and who was and who is to come, and from the seven spirits before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth. Now, we don't usually think that there are political implications to the resurrection because you don't, you know, you don't preach that that often. We don't, you know, but, but the Bible teaches that there are. And this, is what, and this is what was not lost on the apostle and his audience of believers in Rome because he writes in verse 7, To all in Rome who are loved by God and called to be saints, grace and peace to you from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. He's reminding them that though they are living in Rome, God loves them. They're loved by God and the Lord Jesus Christ. And that they are ultimately, not just, not just are, are they living in Rome, but they are ultimately citizens of the kingdom of God. And so what you and I are challenged with in remembering each day is that, yes, this is, this is true. Jesus is resurrected to reign. Not Caesar. Not Donald Trump or any other president. Not Putin, not Maduro, not Diaz Canal. He's the president of Cuba or any other nation's leader. You know, so, you know, this can be, this can be, you know, you can take, you want, you might want to take up a, 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 a weapons and fight, but don't, because this is not what this, this is not what this is about, you know, because then on the one hand, it is, it's, it's true, but it's also heartbreaking that America won't last forever. If you love your country, if you love this country, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah, 
it's true, it won't last forever, and, and, and that is heartbreaking. Because leaders and nations will come and go. Did you hear in the news of what happened in Sudan after 30 years of, of, of horrible leading? Uh, Bashir was overthrown by the army there, and, you know, and I wanted to say thank God. Uh, but, yeah, leaders and nations will come and go. But Jesus is the eternal king. And that doesn't mean, because, because we believe that, that doesn't mean that we demean or revolt against our leaders. Andy Crouch, in writing in the foreword of, of this book, Jesus is Lord, Caesar is Not, Evaluating Empire in New Testament Studies. This is a great little book. I just picked it up and began reading it the other day. I was like, oh, this is great. You know, sorry. <laughs> but this is what he writes. The ethicist Oliver O'Donovan makes the perceptive observation that the resurrection of Jesus, vindicating him as king of kings and lord of lords, does not spell the end of political rule in history. And we might add that, empirically at least, noting the pun, it has not spelled the end of empires, but it has put an end to the claim of rulers to provide salvation, rescue from the conditions of sin and death, we no longer need to invest our political structures with hopes of eternal rescue from the abyss of chaos that has been done and dealt with by Christ. Instead, we grant them humbler status, befitting mere creatures, indeed, creatures of creatures, our own cultural creations meant to serve the purpose of image bearing. They are meant to secure certain kinds of liberty and to provide, as in Daniel's vision, for the flourishing of all. They can only do so when they are chastened by the proclamation of the world's true ruler, the one who truly is the beginning and the end, who has triumphed over death and hell. That's what our governments need to hear, the proclamation of Christ. See, Jesus is resurrected to reign, and that gives us the confidence to be the best American citizens while at the same time citizens of the kingdom of God, loving our country without idolizing it. So what's the conclusion here? Yeah, we're not in a Marvel movie, are we? Yeah, and those hopes and those, those longings that we have, yeah, those are real. The movies are not. Those are the hopes and the longings that we have. That's real. And the resurrection of Christ is so much more. It's so much more. And while it is a comfort, it's so much more than a handy thing to have in the tool belt of faith. So what you don't want, then, is, is because Christ is the resurrected king, you don't want to be his enemy. You don't want to be his enemy. Because as, as we read in the Old, Old Testament reading, his enemies are under his feet. They're trampled under his feet. And that trampling is a show of power and conquest. And Jesus rules until all his enemies are defeated. And the scripture tells us that the last enemy to be defeated is death. Yeah. Hallelujah. Jesus has fought and won the battle over death. It's under his feet. It's made to serve him. So if you're not a Christian, see, God is calling you. He's calling you to faith. Why would you turn? Why would you turn away from the creator's love and his salvation? See, if you are a Christian, then this truth, this truth, you know, the reason we gather to worship, the reason that we talk about this every Sunday, the reason we sing and our praises and, and, you know, and, and, and a lot of us in our personal lives are bowing before the Lord, giving ourselves to him is because this is true. We work this truth that God loves us and he's favored us. We belong to him. We work this truth into the core of our being until it's the driving passion of our lives. So see in the risen Savior the love of God, the call of God, and belonging to God. Hear his offer of grace and peace. Let your identity, your identity be shaped in him. Because Jesus was resurrected to reign, and he fulfilled God's gospel promise as only he could. To the resurrection of the Son of God, the ruler of the kings of the earth is that unifying, that he unifies these two human drives of human expansion 
and being reconciled to one another. Jesus' resurrection guarantees that these will continue. Have you read the end of the book? The Revelation 21, who is on the throne? It's the Lamb of God. And there's a river that flows from his throne. And that river feeds the tree of life. And the leaves of the tree of life is for what? The healing of the nations. That this life continues. It grows. It expands. And we are unified in it. So, you know, if, if Americans are to be saved, if Koreans are to be saved, if Cameroonians are to be saved, if Indians are to be saved, if Pakistanis are to be saved, if Cubans are to be saved, if Puerto Ricans are to be saved, if Hondurans are to be saved, they need to hear this message they need to hear the proclamation that Jesus was raised to reign and to see in his followers the ruler of the kings of the earth his, that he is celebrated by his people who are from every tribe and nation living together in, obe in the obedience of faith. Let's pray.